Bien, quisiera agradecer a los cuatro ponentes sus interesantísimas intervenciones, pero vamos a abundar en alguno de los aspectos que, que han tocado en ellas. Quisiera empezar con la señora Inberg. Usted ha hablado en su ponencia de, de, de estar abiertos a nuevas oportunidades. Eh, nos gustaría que, 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 que se comprometiera un poco en la respuesta a la pregunta que le voy a formular. Teniendo en cuenta la estructura económica vasca, ¿qué se puede hacer para que tenga éxito en la economía global? Well, I mean, I think that the Basque country is well placed in Spain. It, it already has many export-oriented companies. Mm -hmm. It's a small region, so cooperation within the region, you know, is quite relatively easy. Um, within the region, do you mean in Europe? Or? Well, I mean, I actually mean cooperation within the Basque country itself. In between in, its uh, in between companies, something. in between mm -hmm. universities, um, I think that. That should help as well to, you know, to spread innovation. But the Basque Country already has a very good start in terms of being able to export to to other countries, not you know to Germany, to to, to other European countries, but also to, to Asia as well. Um, I just think that you know conferences such as these, um, a greater focus by the government to support R and D, to support innovation to support a different mm -hmm. mindset of risk taking. I think a combination of those things means that the Basque country has a lot of potential uh, to grow from uh, in this particular area. And to be successful in, in, in a global scenario. Exactly. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Inberg. Now, I'd like to, to ask Mr. Tafs, uh, you belong to ERIN. This is an organization, uh, ERIN is an organization that que influye en las políticas europeas de, de innovación y desarrollo. Asimismo, está fuertemente implicada en el, en el desarrollo de proyectos. No obstante, sabemos que las pymes están infrarrepresentadas, eh, precisamente en lo que toca a la participación en, ese, en, esa, en esa práctica, en el desarrollo de los proyectos. ¿Cómo podemos hacer para ayudarlas y para, para que sea mayor el número de pequeñas y medianas empresas que participen en, en el desarrollo de los proyectos europeos? You're absolutely right. There is a deficit of SMEs in, in European projects. Uh, the Commission has always had this 15% target, which we are almost reaching, but it's still very, very difficult. I think there are two areas where um, it's very important. First of all, SMEs need more awareness of the opportunities in Europe, and that's probably what, via the, rather than going directly to the SMEs, I think there's a role for the intermediary organizations. That could be innovation agencies, could be clusters, chambers of commerce. These are the people that need to always sort of collect the information and the, the, as available to SMEs and distill that information to the SMEs. The second thing is very clearly that uh, the, we want to need to work on simplification because there is, at the moment, most SMEs would see the hurdles and the barriers for doing a European project as too much. Um, that they, they find that there's too much administration, there's mm -hmm. too much reporting, there's too much comp confusion of really of how these systems work. Complexity. Is the, it's the complexity is very, very mm -hmm. important. So that's one thing is we need to make sure that the burdens of administration for SMEs are lowered in any further things. And we think from, from the Erin point of view that we need a little bit more proportionality between the administration and the size of the project. If we have smaller projects, we feel that this, we should be reducing the amount of sort of administrative burdens, on, on, particularly on SMEs. Um, but it's also important to see that the, um, there, are, there are opportunities for, particularly for research performing SMEs, but we have to remember that many SMEs are not research performing. So that there is, a, there, is a, there is quite a lot of opportunities for research performing SMEs in Europe. Um, there are programs such as Eurostars, uh, Research for SMEs, and we would encourage uh, SMEs to look at those programs. But otherwise, a lot of the SMEs can get engaged in other types of programs where they can be using innovation and demonstrating innovative activities as well. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Tafs. Um, uh, Señor De Vol, um, Probablemente habrá escuchado en, en muchos sitios que eh, la innovación, la senda de la innovación, más que generar empleo, 
puede terminar destruyéndolo. Porque la I más D genera procesos más eficientes pero menos intensivos en mano de obra. Siempre se argumenta que se generarán nuevas oportunidades, pero nos cabe la duda de si las nuevas empresas, las empresas que se pueden generar en, en la nueva economía, serán capaces de absorber el volumen de empleo que proporcionaba la industria. La pregunta sería, ¿la economía de la innovación es capaz de generar el suficiente empleo duradero? ¿Y qué experiencia positiva de los Estados Unidos nos podría eh, mostrar brevemente? I didn't get the translation in my ears. You didn't get the translation. Okay. Um, I, I was telling that um, the, the enterprises of the, the so-called new economy uh, might not be able to uh, produce the same uh, job opportunities or, or the same job, job quantity sure. as the industry was doing. So the question would be if uh, an in innovation economy would be capable of generate uh, enough, sure. enough jobs. And if there is a, an experience in the USA that you could portray as a good Certainly. one? Well, very good question. Um, I, I think at first it's critical to understand if you're an advanced economy, you don't have a choice to be a competitive player in the innovation economy because if you're not a player in the innovation economy, you have no chance to create future job growth. Um, the days when you can compete solely on the basis of cost Uh, are long gone in an advanced economy. That's not to say that you shouldn't try to remain cost competitive within the framework that you operate in, in the industries that you're involved in. Um, but that's not the key to success any longer. You really have to break it apart, in my opinion, to kind of incremental uh, innovation as opposed to um, transformational innovation. Um, incremental innovation will typically Uh, boost efficiency and productivity, which can result in the loss of jobs in, in specific industries and in various uh, uh, countries as well. But if you look at transformational innovations, you're talking about creating entirely new industries, new segments um, that typically will lead to new employment opportunities. What typically will happen is the The current industries uh, will lose employment and the occupational skill sets will be adjusted and so there's a very difficult transition to go through yeah. as you're moving from a traditional based economy to one that's increasingly based on innovation in creating new firms and new industries and it's important to have the workforce uh, skill training to support that, that change. Um, if you look at the United States as an example, Uh, we've had a lot of industries where employment has been lost at mm -hmm. a very high rate. Um, one of them today would be the communications technology industry, looking at the traditional um, communications industry. But there have been entirely new industries spawned by the implementation of the semiconductor industry, communications technologies. If you think about it today, uh, Apple probably represents... Mm -hmm the true innovation global economy. Uh, you could say Google's very close to that, but Apple still creates, designs its products and services, principally in the United States, although it is starting to innovate elsewhere as well. Uh, it still does most of its uh, initial uh, manufacturing and looking at the concept manufacturing in the United States, but most of its products are developed from around the world, principally in Asia, is where they're produced in Asia. Produced yeah. in Asia. Uh, there's other examples, the biotechnology industry. This is where the United States still leads in innovation in the world by far. Not that we don't have competitors such as Singapore that are up and coming, but you have to keep in mind that the United States is 310 million people, and so it's a much larger economy. But biotechnology and the biopharmaceuticals, there have been uh, In the United States, about a half a million jobs just in that sector. And while jobs in some of the more traditional manufacturing sectors have gone abroad, uh, it's important for the United States to keep as much of that value chain as possible. But it is still also possible to be in the innovation economy and be creating jobs. So the key is to try and retain as much of the value chain 
out of new innovation for as long as possible before it comes commoditized. To me, that's the, the, will determine the success of the United States or any advanced economy. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. DeVol. Uh, Ms. Penny Lowe, uh, usted es la presidenta del uh, Social Innovation Park de Singapur. Además, es fundadora del Grupo Nuevos Líderes de Asia en el Foro Económico de Davos y afirma que es necesario incorporar la voz de los jóvenes a los procesos de toma de decisión. ¿De qué manera se puede hacer esto? ¿Y se está haciendo algo en este sentido en Singapur? I too, you know, could not get all of the translation was coming I, I in can and tell out. You, I yeah. can tell you. You, you, you have said that uh, there is a need to incorporate youngs to the decision-making processes. The question is if whether, uh, how okay. do you think yeah. that could be done and whether it is happening already in Singapore or not? Well, um, perhaps uh, I should uh, make a, a small correction. Uh, I am one of the early members of the New Asian Leader, but actually one of the founders of the uh, Young Global Leaders, which is an organization that's attached to the World Economic Forum. And um, uh, one of the things that uh, we should be aware of, and perhaps this is a quiz. Can I, can I do a quick quiz? Yes, sure. <laughs> yeah? First, go ahead. Okay. So, a very quick quiz. Um, how many people are there in the world today? Just, just shout it out. 6.9. 6.9 billion. There is only one answer in the, amongst the whole crowd. <laughs> Any others? Any others? 7,000 million. So there's 7 billion. You are all very well connected, highly informed, and uh, therefore ready for the world. You are absolutely right. 6.97 billion people. Quiz number two. How many people of this 7 billion people are 25 years and below? No question. Percentage, percentage. How many? 7? 70% 70 70  25 years old and below. Whoa, we've got hope. <laughs> Anyone else? 30%, 40%, 50, 50%, going higher, higher, anyone higher than 70%? Oh, it's a reverse auction, okay, lower, 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 any more? I go for 60. So the answer is approximately 50%, 50%, in other words, 3.5 billion people are 25 years and below. What does that tell us? A lot of trouble, especially for politicians. <laughs> no, it, it really, you know, it's a, it's a case where the world has really, you know, changed quite a lot because there has been huge shift in the demography of the world altogether. True. And this shift itself has come about with two extremes. One is quite a lot of young people, but not necessarily in the cities, mm. more in the rural and the uh, uh, developing nations. And at the same time, there's also a very fast aging society, especially in the cities. Uh, I heard that uh, Basque country is also in one of the Europe, fastest yes. aging uh, outside Japan. Uh, Singapore is also one of the fastest aging with a fertility rate that is right rock bottom. Um, all of this you know, means that on one hand, the young people are increasing in numbers. They are also the ones who are most adept at using new technology. Uh, to do everything from their education to their connection with their friends immediately within the school, with the community, outside the country, internationally, and so on. So how, how could they be incorporated to the decision-making yes. process? And, and therefore... It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be easy. No, it's not. And, and in fact, if you think about that, the age that people start on technology is getting younger and younger. Yeah. Uh, the age I heard that where they learn the most and has got the greatest potential to use technology to change the world is between five to eight years old. So, so you mean that there, there is a, a way for them to participate through the new IT media? So, so what I'm saying therefore is that we have to now start thinking things from the perspective and viewpoint 
of 50% of the world. What, what has we have seen? been thinking about things. How do we change policies? How do we you know, look at um, implementing uh, institutional or organizational uh, objectives from the view of policy makers top down? What have but you done truth, in Singapore? Yeah, but the truth is that the 50% is making a lot of decisions on their own and collectively as a body of interest groups. This means it's not just a question of them connecting within Singapore to make the changes, they're also connecting with the rest of the world, learning from peers to make the changes. For example, the Egyptian uprising itself was interesting on its own because they have used ICT, information communication and te technology, to connect with each other through SMS, through Twitter, through Facebook, to make all the changes and you know, topple a very, very age old and Settled. centralized and established institution, not overnight but fast enough, which was unimaginable. Yeah. But that success itself has then spread to many other places, mm. Spain included. And this is by no coincidence. It's because of the connectivity itself that they felt to be a lot more empowered and enabled to learn from each other and to also do the same thing with methodologies, experience shared from across the board. So how do we then look at this? As a policy makers and as politicians, sometimes we look at it, we're a little bit scared and of course, you know, um, with a lot of trepidation because you know, they may not agree with us, we may not see point to point and the traditional powers and centers of hierarchy has now completely been disintermediated and so we have to find new ways to talk to them and find new communication methods so that if they cannot understand our language, we must at least try to understand the language of the youth. At the, sa at the same time, companies, private sector are also concerned about the youth voices because they no longer are just the very weak consumers. They are now making their voices heard by having online petitions, by blogging about a bad product or a bad service, and all these are not to be neglected. Mm -hmm. So if we look at all this, we can be very scared, we can be very negative, but you see, the truth is that the technology is neutral and even the youth can be very neutral. It depends on how we, so-called uh, above 25 years old, look at the technology and their ability to connect with each other and harness this energy that they have exhibited all this while and galvanize them towards a positive cause or a positive objective and a mission. We have to give the youth something to fight for. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lowe. Como ven, la señora Lowe eh, propone mejoras en la comunicación entre los bajo 25 y los sobre 25. Hay numerosas cuestiones eh, del interés de todos probablemente y tenemos ocasión, ustedes van a tener ocasión a continuación de formular alguna pregunta a algunos de los expertos aquí presentes, pero no nos queremos olvidar de los que están participando de este evento eh, virtualmente o a través de las redes sociales. Eh, vamos a a dar oportunidad primero de recibir alguna pregunta formulada a través de Twitter y mientras tanto pueden ir ustedes pensando alguna otra para formulársela más tarde a, a los expertos. Tenemos aquí una pregunta eh, que nos ha llegado a través de Twitter que dice, es para, para Penny Lowe precisamente, this is a question for you, Miss Lowe, ¿se necesita un cambio de mentalidad para innovar? Do we need to change our mindsets in yeah, order to be innovative? I'll, I'll change in my well, I think innovation by definition itself means that you need to shift from an uh, ex existing position. And that naturally means that we have to think out of the box or we have to look at things from a different perspective. Hmm. So, yes. It's basic. Yes. Necesario. Bien. Eh, quienes quieran formular alguna pregunta pueden solicitar los micrófonos, pueden levantar la mano. Tenemos micrófonos a su disposición. Veo, veo una, un, dos manos. Sí, enseguida les pasan el micrófono. Estupendo. Uh, hi. Hello. Okay. Uh, Miss Lowe. 
I had a, like, it was really funny to hear that 50% of the population of the world is under 25. But my question would be for all of us here, if half of the room is under 25. Because if we're talking about innovation, the less we can do is at least, like, get the youngsters to come to conferences like this, because otherwise, there's no point. Mm. Well, actually, I would speak in defense of the uh, organizers <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're on Twitter and on uh, uh, maybe a website and blogs. So I believe that most of the Twitter users and the blog users are probably young people as well. But, but I do also have a little complaint. I've been trying to tweet, but unfortunately, I couldn't log in. Can someone give me the password for the Wi-Fi? Mm. <laughs> My question is, can we rise up? people with under 25? Rise up hands. Under 25? Not bad. Okay, that's another 50, but go on to Steph. Thank you. Yeah, plus the Twitter, plus the Twitter population, you might get it. <laughs> Muy bien. Podemos pasar a la siguiente, al siguiente participante. ¿Había algún otro brazo levantado? Sí. Ahora mismo le llevan el micrófono. Hola, buenas tardes, muchas gracias. Eh, también la, mi pregunta es para Penny Lowe. Eh, me ha gustado mucho tu exposición. Eh, soy de Chile. Y bueno, eh, tengo dos preguntas que hacerte en, en relación a la experiencia de Singapur. Si pudieras definir en breves palabras cuál o cuáles crees que fueron los elementos fundamentales que favorecieron para que Singapur pasara del tercer al primer mundo. Eh, y, por, y la otra pregunta es, ¿de qué manera se ha mantenido este crecimiento? Ya que nos has comentado que tiene un muy bajo índice de, de desempleo y me imagino que esto también tiene que ver con la exportación de tecnología el, y que ha sido algo principal en lo que ustedes han podido aportar al mundo. Muchas gracias. Well, um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, your kind compliments uh, about uh, my speech, but also the uh, Singapore's growth. Um, the quick answer is with a lot of hard work. As I, I said in the in the beginning of my speech itself, um, Singapore has absolutely nothing underground. And therefore, what matters is everyone who stands above ground. So the fundamental success factor is the, re, is the realization that we need to have peace in order to have prosperity. Therefore, institutionalizing peace in Singapore itself, and back in 1960s, remember there was a lot of civil riots, was fundamental to our success. And that continued peace remains a centerpiece even though we have already moved on from that stage. And that's because Singapore is also a multicultural, multi-ethnic group society. Yeah. It's like a kaleidoscope of mosaic pieced together. So re maintaining the religious, racial, ethnic harmony is extremely important and something that we worked on on a daily basis in the schools, in the housing estates, in the workplace, and everywhere. It's fundamental in our policy to maintain that peace so we can have prosperity. Then the second is to invest very heavily in education because unless we enhance the quality of our only natural resource, meaning human capital, there is no way that we could be moving up the value chain itself. So the Ministry of Education on a year-to-year -year basis occupies one of the top GDP uh, uh, budgets in our overall national budget. And of course, many of the methodologies of teaching have also moved from that of didactic teaching, traditional, to that of having um, IT as becoming a central part and collaboration amongst people within the school, but also outside the school and outside the country as a centerpiece. And this answers your question about how do we get youth to be involved in policy making, in thinking through projects, objectives, and so on. Um, for example, every year when we have a national budget debate itself, we would also set up platforms and e-platforms where the uh, youth's view would be invited mm -hmm. and also play out scenes whereby 
the youth themselves becomes the Minister of Finance, mm -hmm. and then what type of policies would they themselves come up with? Then the third piece, of course, is to ensure that there is sufficient investment so that we can continue to provide the jobs after people are educated, because otherwise we will have a youth uprising very quickly if the unemployment rate is high. And central to all of that is the ability to attract, attract and retain talents, mm -hmm. top talents from around the world, but also within Singapore. Because unless our talents are there, no matter what type of Singapore we are today, it will very, very quickly disintegrate as talents move away, mm -hmm. jobs move away, and investments move away, then we are kaput. <laughs> um, last but not least is the realization that we are nothing without being relevant to the people, which is Singaporeans. We must mean something to them. And we must also stay relevant to the rest of the world. Because as a business hub of the world, as a trading hub of the world, as a logistic hub of the region, we need to stay relevant and therefore collaborate, befriend, study and serve the region with a lot of humility. So those are some of the critical Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe. Uh, I just want to appreciate your interventions. Uh, Penny Lowe again, the president of uh, Social Innovation Park in Singapore. Ms. Uh, C. Devol uh, from the Milken Institute in California. Ms. Uh, Maya Inberg from The Economist and Mr. Richard Tafts from Erin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, you, you can, uh, you can get a few seats. <laughs>